Hello, my name is Rickard Brandström and I work as a researcher at the Karolinska Institute and I'm very excited to be invited to speak today uh, about my research. Uh, I would like to show you some pictures so I will start with sharing my screen. Sharing my screen and start a PowerPoint presentation. <clears throat> right, so today I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the research that I have been involved with uh, relating to why are LGBTQ people at increased risk of mental health problems because that's a uh, uh, question that, that, that um, we have been trying to deal with in uh, my research group during the last couple of years. So, uh, and why is that? Well. One of the main reasons is that there's been a lot of research uh, lately showing that LGBT people have an increased risk of mental health problems. Uh, and also, uh, so there's reason to trying to understand why that is. And I'll begin with showing some numbers from Sweden. This data comes from a survey conducted by the Swedish Public Health Agency, uh, and they send out invitations to participate in a health survey every uh, or regularly, and it's random samples of the population in the age group 16 to 84 years. And they also ask questions about sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, so in this, these surveys in general about 92% or so identify or say they identify as heterosexuals and then 1.2% uh, uh, say that they identify as gay or lesbians and 2.6% identify as bisexuals. There is also a question uh, about transgender experiences, uh, something like are you or have you been transgender with a definition of what that um, what, what they mean with that and uh, in general about 0.7% say that they have uh, such experience and uh, that is similar to what other population estimates have shown internationally as well so it seemed to be uh, around that number um, so as you can see, there's small proportions of the population that, that um, identify as sexual minorities and uh, report experience as a gender identity or a gender minority individual. Um, so in this survey, there's questions about several aspects of health, for example. <clears throat> the questions makes it possible to categorize people into those who have elevated depression symptoms. And when we look at the data here, so here we have the different groups, heterosexuals, gay and lesbians, uh, bisexuals, and those who report a transgender experience. And this is the proportion reporting elevated depressive symptoms. So about 16% of the population among those identified as heterosexuals claim that they have elevated depressive symptoms. Uh, almost twice as many, 30%, among those identifying as gay and lesbian, and even a little higher among those identifying as bisexuals. And 32% uh, in the group uh, who says, who say they have a transgender identity, also report elevated depression symptoms. So quite a lot of increased risk, about twice or a little higher risk of depressive symptoms within the LGBT group here. Um, there's also some questions about suicidality. One question about past 12 month suicide thoughts and past 12 month suicide attempts. Uh, here the proportions are smaller, but the increased risk in these three groups, bisexuals, gay and lesbians, and transgender individuals is the same or even a little higher, uh, almost three times as common uh, among these groups compared to those identifying as heterosexuals and 
cisgender. And you can see the same similar pattern for suicide attempts. And this is similar to what international studies have shown. Uh, but this is um, also uh, a survey where we can link these survey responses to treatment data. So we have done that and we were interested in understanding. So is it uh, so that people are, because this is self-reported information, but is it also that these people are getting treatment for mental health problems to a higher extent? So we looked at that data. So it's the same people basically, the same survey, but we're looking at registry information about treatment for depression, treatment for anxiety disorders, and treatment for substance use disorder. And when we look at depression, we see a similar pattern. We see that gay and lesbians, bisexuals, and trans people uh, all have an increased risk compared to heterosexuals. And the same is true for anxiety disorder. And uh, when it comes to substance use disorders, it's fewer or a smaller proportion receiving that type of treatment, but still a little higher. Uh, the prevalence is still a little higher within the LGBT groups. So this is, uh, is um, uh, really telling us uh, even more strongly that there definitely is a, an increased risk in both reporting and receiving treatment for mental health disorders within the LGBT group. So the question then is why? And what can we do about it? Uh, why are LGBT individuals experience poor mental health? Well, many of the studies trying to understand this uh, use predictors or risk factors uh, that can be organized in different levels. At the structural levels, risk factors that have been studied are things like uh, living in a country with discriminatory legislation, uh, with limited access to healthcare, or also living uh, in a cultural context or environment that is hostile with negative population attitudes, for example, towards LGBT people. And that is believed to increase the likelihood that you're exposed to different interpersonal stressors, things like victimization, threats, or discrimination. And being exposed to this type of stressors are believed to also influence different individual level things like, like uh, the likelihood of concealing sexual orientation to try to avoid uh, these types of uh, victimization and discrimination. Stress of uh, negotiating also concealment in different contexts, but also uh, stress around expecting to be exposed to negative events and also internalization of society's negative attitudes like internalized homo negativity of different sorts and all these factors are believed to contribute to the increased risk of mental health among lgbt people and many studies now also show that this is true several of these factors uh, are strong predictors of, of negative uh, mental health and I would like to share some of the studies that we have been looking at to try to explore these factors. I will begin with one study looking at the structural level, looking at discriminatory legislation and, and population attitudes, uh, things at a, at a country level actually, uh, to try to see how that is influencing the mental health of the population living in those countries. So to study this structural level, we went to a survey that was conducted last year. It's a large scale study. It's, I think, 130,000 people across um, Europe that responded to this survey. And it included lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans people, and also intersex people uh, they were trying to recruit. So it's a big group uh, of people contributing with information in this. So it was conducted by the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights. And they have reported some of the research, uh, some of the results from this survey uh, on their web page. Uh, this, in, in, I think in, in 
in May this year. So you can check it out on their web page. But I will also present some here. What we were interested to understand, we, we, we wanted to look at the structural level factors. So uh, what we did was we, we tried to code each country depending on the structural stigma context or, or, or giving them like a score based on how stigmatizing they were both when it comes to legislation and attitudes. To collect information about legislation, we use the ILGA map. The ILGA is an organization that collects this information from, from um, all countries across the globe, but uh, ILGA Europe uh, makes this map that gives you, gives each country well, in this case, a percentage of, of how uh, that reflects their legal and policy human rights situation in each country. So the green countries are the more positive when it comes to LGBT rights and non-discrimination, and the red countries are those who are worse. So we use this information and combine it with attitudes uh, in the population, and we use then information from attitude surveys. We use data from the European Social Survey, which is done every other year in most European countries, or a lot of European countries at least. One of the questions that they ask in this survey is, uh, are gay men, uh, gay men and lesbians should be free to live their own life as they wish? And this is the proportion who, in each country, on average, that agree. So in Sweden, it's like, over 90% agrees with this statement, and the same is tr true in Netherlands and Norway and UK. However, in Eastern European countries like Estonia, Poland, Czechia, uh, far fewer agrees that gay, and gay men and lesbians should be free to live their life as they wish, and in Russia, uh, only about 15% agrees. And as you can see here, we plotted these countries uh, based on also their discriminatory legislation coming from this ILGA score. So you can see also that there's kind of a pattern here that with worse legislation, there's also worse, worse population attitudes. So a link here. Another question that was used in the data set was, I, if a close family member would be gay or a lesbian, I would feel ashamed. And here is the proportion who agrees with that statement. So very few in Norway and Netherlands uh, that are also low stigma when it comes to legislation and policy, according to this index that we create uh, used, uh, about 5% would feel ashamed, but almost 70% uh, of the population in Russia Places that they would feel ashamed if a close family member would be gay or lesbian. So a huge difference in attitudes across countries. What we did was, was that we combined information about discriminatory legislation with negative population attitudes and created a country level stigma score, as we called it. And we used that to plot the different countries and see what the mental health situation looked like in the LGBT people who responded to the EU LGBTI survey last year. We used then a, a measure of depression, like last two week depression symptoms. And these are the proportion reporting elevated levels of depression in the different countries plotted on here on the x axis is this country level stigma score. So high score, high stigma, low score, lower stigma. So you can see that in Netherlands and Denmark, that ended up on the lower end of our stigma scale, uh, about 20% reported elevated depressive symptoms during the past two weeks, which is high too, I would say, um, but uh, maybe more similar to uh, what a population average would look like. Uh, however, there's a clear link here with stigma. And in more higher stigma places like Macedonia, Poland, Latvia, and Lithuania, uh, around 40 or even higher proportion of the LGBTI population reported 
the pressure symptoms. So we saw a very clear pattern here, uh, which is maybe not surprising, but still uh, I was a bit surprised to see this very clear pattern when it comes, because many things influence your mental health and your depressive symptoms. Uh, but clearly the environment in which you live, the rights you have, and how people around you, the attitudes they have against you or towards you seem to be quite highly influential uh, of your mental health. So this uh, gives a strong support for the model that I just showed you with risk factors at different levels influencing the mental health of LGBTI people. So the conclusions really from this study was that LGBTI individuals mental health varies greatly across countries in Europe and the variation can very to a large extent be explained by the structural climate or environment in those countries and of course this really highlights the importance of reducing structural stigma and trying to change the situation when it comes to LGBT uh, rights and attitudes in the population to try to really reduce the risk of mental health problems within this group. But also until that is uh, reached, uh, until everyone is, has equal rights and tolerant attitudes, we might need to also develop tailored affirmative psychotherapies that can address the stresses around the structural context surrounding sexual minorities in high stigma context to try to improve the mental health situation there. Now I've been talking a lot about structural le level and uh, the environment at a country level when it comes to legislation and population attitudes, but uh, I would now like to shift and look more at the uh, risk factors at the individual and interpersonal level and also looking at uh, some data here in Sweden too because many would regard Sweden as a relatively low stigma context when it comes to like uh, legal rights and attitudes too. In this study we looked specifically at suicidality which is an area where a lot of studies have shown that LGBT people um, are at increased risk. In this study we used this theoretical model looking at factors at <clears throat> structural interpersonal individual level but in particular we wanted to uh, see so so several studies have shown that suicide risk is definitely influenced by things like victimization, threats and discrimination, and uh, several of these things too. But uh, we also wanted to look at uh, how, so we also knew that these uh, factors influence depression and substance use, and depression and substance use are also risk factors for suicide. Yeah, but we also uh, wanted to look at more uh, rather well-established uh, risk factors for suicidality that hasn't been looked at as much within the LGBT context. Things like barriers to social societal integration and, and many studies have shown that uh, being married or living with a partner is a protective factor for uh, suicidality. Not living with children is a risk factor. Lack of societal trust, how you trust other people around you is also a risk factor for suicidality and being unemployed. So we wanted to put this in the context of uh, trying to explain sexual minorities increased risk of mental health problems. We, the material we used was data from this nationwide population-based health survey conducted by the Public Health Agency of Sweden. And we used a couple of years to kind of pool together those uh, numbers. It was people 16 to 84 years, 
A total of almost 60,000 individuals uh, completed the survey. Uh, I talked about this earlier, the proportion of sexual minorities, but the, the measures that we used were uh, past 12 months suicide ideation and attempts. Uh, the predictors or risk factors that we wanted to study was both psychological risk factors, things like depression and substance use, interpersonal risk factors, things like discrimination, victimization, and lack of so social support that we believed were important uh, to explain the increased risk within the sexual minority group. And we also looked at uh, several, what we call barriers to societal integration, not being married, not living with children, lack of societal trust and being unemployed. So we put this into an advanced uh, statistical analysis and I won't go into all the details here, but what was clear was that all of our risk factors, both psychological, interpersonal, and various social implication, are strongly related to suicidality, both attempts and suicide ideation. And most of them were also much more common among gay and lesbians and bisexual as compared to heterosexuals. So, uh, LGB people were more likely to report depression, substance use, discrimination, victimization. Victimization was actually not significantly more common among gay and lesbians, but it was for bisexuals. Lack of social support was, most, was more common among both gay, lesbian, and bisexuals compared to heterosexuals, uh, and being married and partner were less common and not living with children uh, was also more common among LGB people. Lack of societal trust was more common among the bisexuals and also being unemployed were more common among the bisexuals. So what we found was that using all of these risk factors to try to explain the increased risk of suicidality, we were actually able to explain most of the difference between uh, sexual orientation groups. And so many of these factors are important in the explanation of suicidality and should be targeted to successfully prevent suicidality within this group. However, these societal integration factors are maybe more difficult to target with preventive efforts. Uh, and maybe we need to think of other ways uh, to change norms around uh, what uh, societal integration looks like. So our conclusions was really that barriers to societal integration represent an under-investigated mechanism of the, uh, of the uh, fairly large sexual orientation disparity we find in suicidality. It confirms the important role of sexual minority exposure to psychological and interpersonal risk factors. Um, and it also extends research in different, uh, on course, courses of, of the higher prevalence of suicidality within sexual minority group. Uh, during the spring, we have also tried to look at the transgender group in a similar fashion and really have found a similar pattern when it comes to risk factors of suicidality for, for trans individuals. Preventive intervention should support sexual minority and trans gender communities to challenge outdated and overly rigid definitions of societal meaning and purpose to ensure that such pursuits themselves are valued and maybe we need to question the, the current norms around, around uh, societal factors. Uh, that was a study looking more into the individual interpersonal factors that are important to understand mental health among LGBT people. Uh, but what can then be done to improve mental health among LGBT individuals? Well, if these 
other risk factors and we find increasing support that these are in fact explaining the increased risk we should be able to target these and, and social action is really a way to try to influence factors at the structural environmental level through activism knowledge dissemination and also increased visibility are things that can influence attitude population attitudes cultural norms and of course legislation as well and this um, should lead to increased likelihood of being exposed to these things like discrimination victimization assaults uh, so very important to continue and work with increased visibility and, and these events like pride events are of course extremely important both to mobilize uh, activism but also to mobilize uh, uh, to, for increased visibility uh, but we could also look at more individual factors and uh, there's been quite a lot of research trying to understand ah, mechanism how are these individual stressors leading to mental health problems and some of the mechanisms that have been, in, um, been identified are things like cognitive emotional and behavioral things that leads uh, makes these stressors increase the risk of mental health things like hypervigilance, rumination, social isolation, avoidant behavior and substance abuse that are more common among uh, LGBT people uh, with problems with mental health. Uh, and these mechanisms are things that effective psychological intervention can intervene upon. So lately there has been several attempts to try to develop LGBTQ affirmative psychotherapies. And several of these are now being evaluated both in high and low stigma settings so we will know much more about how effective these uh, targeted or lgbt affirmative psychotherapies are in the future so hopefully that will help to support this group and reduce the increased risk of mental health some final conclusions LGBTI individuals are faced with increased risk of mental health problems in Europe and globally. And this uh, recent research has definitely begun to increase our understanding of the sources and mechanisms behind these disparities. And uh, these results that I just showed you with structural level stigma being an important predictor of mental health is of particular uh, importance of course when we see that several countries are going in the wrong direction many countries are definitely improving both the legislation and attitudes but several countries are also going in the wrong direction with uh, declining acceptance in the population and, and more and more discriminatory legislation the challenge to reduce these disparities in the future is, is definitely like in our hands and we should let research uh, lead our decisions and actions with the aim to ultimately eliminate mental health disparities based on sexual and gender identity. Some of the research uh, that has been done has been uh, summarized in these reports that I like to recommend. It's uh, published last year or, uh, in the Swedish, for, by the Swedish Research Council for Health, Working Life and Welfare, FOTE. And if you're interested in psychotherapy or work with this group, uh, I can also recommend this book. It's a handbook of evidence-based mental health practice with sexual and gender minorities that which recently was published, uh, giving a very good overview of different programs and strategies to try to support mental health within this group. Okay, thank you so much for your attention. And please, uh, Contact me if you have questions or want to get involved in the research we're doing in, in this field. Thank you so much.